There is a favorite Corpus Christi story that I must share as I begin this homiletic reflection, and this comes from Cardinal Manning. He was fond of saying this to young bishops who had some sense of Episcopal importance, and the story is set in Italy some years ago, and in the old countries we had Corpus Christi processions, and they'd close everything down and all the people would march with great pomp and great ceremony in a Corpus Christi procession, and at the end of the procession, the bishop would carry a monstrance, a large monstrance with uh, the host in it. And it so happened that on this occasion, it was very warm. It was a hot day. And the bishop, with all his heavy vestments and carrying a heavy monstrance, got weak. And they wondered how to finish the procession. So Luigi was coming in from the fields with his donkey, and they said, Luigi, bring over the donkey here. So they brought over the donkey, and they put the monstrance on the back of the saddle of the donkey, and the bishop walked behind the donkey, and they went along. So the donkey was walking along with the blessed sacrament up on his back, and he noticed the people were bowing as he went by, and he said, I like this. The donkey never had this before. So he went along a little bit more, and an altar server came in front of him and incensed him, and his ears went up, and he said, wow, this is very nice. And then he got into the piazza, and the bishop went in front of him and genuflected in front of the donkey, and the donkey's ears went way up, and he said to himself, I am one important jackass. <laughs> Well, you might keep that in mind for people who think they have some kind of inflated self-importance. Uh, my, my mother would have said they have notions. It was a euphemism they used in Ireland. Let's look at this uh, Corpus Christi. Um, the scripture on it is extraordinary. I, I mean, we could spend a long time talking. I'd like to talk a little bit about the background and then some brief comment on the theology of the Eucharist and then the practical pastoral implications of it. So for the background, in Matthew and in Mark, and I'll give you the references because people at home look this up. In Matthew and Mark, there are two miracles of feeding the multitude. In Mark, it's chapter 6 and chapter 8. In Matthew, it's 15 and 16. One is feeding 5,000, and the other is feeding the 4,000. Two different miracles. Now, some commentators think it's just a remembrance of the same miracle twice, but Virgil Pixner and his colleagues, these scholars, Pixner, a scholar from Galilee, he says, no, there are two feedings, and he has very nuanced arguments for it, I'll mention in a moment. Chapter 9 in Luke is our text today, just mentioned once in Luke. And in John, chapter 6, is the feeding of the multitude, 5,000. And in the Gospel of John, this is his theology of Eucharist. So clearly, the feeding of the multitude is meant in the early church to be an image of the Eucharist. And clearly, it's very important remembrance. It's in all four Gospels. Actually, in chapter 6 in John's Gospel, his whole theology of the Eucharist is in this feeding of the multitude and the homily that Jesus gives. Since in the Gospel of John, as you know, there is no confection of the Eucharist at the Last Supper. John has the washing of the feet instead. So clearly, it's an image of the Eucharist. So let me talk about the feeding of the 5,000, the first great miracle of feeding the multitude. They're in a deserted place. Jesus heals those who needed to be cured. And then he, through this miracle, he feeds the multitude. Now, they said there were 5,000 there. And uh, Pixner is very strong on the fact that the baskets which are left over after the miracle, there were 12, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles to share the gift of the miracle. And the Greek word is kofinoi, which indicates a large basket found near a flour mill. So it's different from the baskets in the second feeding. 
Now, if you follow the geography, the geography for the second miracle of the 4,000 will lead you into Gerasene territory, pagan territory, on the Syrian side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, you remember this Gerasene territory because that's where Jesus, remember, he drove out the demons and they went into the pigs and all the pigs ran and went, fell into the sea. Remember that? That was kind of an exceptional miracle where everybody says, how about the guy who owned the pigs? But that's another story. But nonetheless, it's pagan territory. And therefore, he, it's meant to indicate the feeding of the Gentiles. It's in Gerasene, a place called Kursi, Gerasene territory. And here there are seven baskets left over when they finish. And the Greek word for the basket is spiridia, which means a lunch basket. And if you read the text in Matthew and Mark for the second feeding, you'll find out they pursued Jesus. And so Pixner and these people said they carried their lunch baskets with them. So that's enough of the background on this. The place where this feeding of the multitude in all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000, is archaeologically very well established. And I think many of the pilgrims here at Mass, we remember that we had a Mass, outdoor Mass, in the place where this miracle happened, down by the Sea of Galilee and the northeast shore, a very beautiful contemplative and scenic place. So that's some background on this. But it's well worth looking it up for those of you who are following the scriptures and those who would like to get involved with researching this and learning more about it. It's an image of the Eucharist. Now, who qualifies to receive the miracle bread? Those who are hungry. Nobody discusses whether you merited this, whether you were a sinner or whether you were a saint. If you were hungry, the miracle fed you. Image of the Eucharist, please. So now let's look at the theology of the Eucharist. There is a very strong affinity between the incarnation and the miracle of the Eucharist. Now, I am convinced myself that anybody who believes in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist cannot walk away from the Roman Catholic Church. You can't find it anywhere else. The power of Jesus Christ, the body and blood of Jesus Christ given to us in reality. How do you walk away from this? No, I can get better homilies somewhere else. I can't get better music somewhere else, but I can get better homilies. And I can have maybe a bigger community, a more articulate place, a place that's more on fire, but I can't get the Eucharist. And I am in the Roman Catholic Church because the Eucharist holds me in here. And that's the, that's the miracle given to us. So the nexus between the incarnation where the infinite love of God chooses, not because we, we deserve, but because we needed God's presence in our humanity to affirm us and to sanctify our humanity. So God, in the God-man, a prophet, a rabbi, in the first third of the first century, enters into humanity, our humanity, takes on the wholeness of our humanity. He will sing, he will rejoice, he will belong to his family, he will know the love of a family. He will have vocation fulfillment. He will know what it means to leave his family and to go on a mission lonely for his family. He will experience fear, anxiety. He will experience loss, judgment, betrayal, denial, loneliness. He will experience hunger. His whole humanity is given to us in God becoming human like us, as Paul says, in all things but sin. And now, we come to the Last Supper. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in our second reading from the first letter of Paul to Corinth today, we have Jesus taking bread, something very ordinary, like bread. 
He, bless, he takes the bread first, then he blesses the bread, then the bread is broken, and then the bread is shared. And now, the action, the action is very important. Taking the bread, blessing the bread, breaking the bread, and sharing the bread so that we may have life. Teaching us about true riches, not the riches of the world, but true riches. God becomes human, and now in Jesus Christ, he shares his very self, his body and his blood with us. That's an extraordinary, you stop and think about this. This is the gift of divine presence, the flesh and blood, the gift of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. St. Augustine, in his Sermon on the Eucharist, says, Behold what you are, and become what you receive. It's not a matter of receiving communion, receiving the Eucharist. It's a matter of becoming the Eucharist. It's a matter of letting God take you, call you, call you by name, call you into discipleship, bless you, and you will be broken in discipleship, and you will be shared so that others can have life. You know, Mary Ternan, in her ministry to the sick and the homebound person, has something like 70 or 80 Eucharistic ministers. And they go out, but they don't bring just communion, they bring Eucharist. They bring the dog, the cat, the children, the bulletin, the newspaper, bring bread. They drive the person to a doctor. They become bonded to the person. They become living Eucharist for the person. It's not bringing Eucharist, it's becoming Eucharist. So much so that most of the homebound people don't even want to see the priest. They love the Eucharistic minister. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Amazing, you know, when I came here first 31 years ago, on the first Friday, some of the older folks here may remember, the priest would go around to all the homebound people with communion. Only the priest could take communion. Hey, we are Eucharist. We are living Eucharist. What does this mean to us? Now, Pope Francis says, the Eucharist is not food for the perfect. It's nourishment and sustenance, a powerful medicine for those who are weak. It's not a reward for a good life. It's food for the journey. It's not given to those who are perfect. It's given to those who are hungry, to those who are needful. Now, this, will, this must become real to us. Because we come here on Sunday, we receive the Eucharist. You could lose your life out in the parking lot after this. I mean, I might meet somebody after Mass and say, well, I didn't like the music or the homily was a bit too long. And I say, but did you receive the Eucharist? Well, I did, but you know. Oh, the Eucharist. We must become Eucharist. How will this affect you? It will affect you this very day. Because somewhere, as you journey through this day, in God's providence, unanticipated perhaps, you will be taken. You will be blessed in discipleship. You will be broken and you will be shared so that another may have life, not because they deserve it, but because they need it. It's in your family. It's in your relationships. It's in your community. How do I allow myself to become Eucharist, to be broken, to be shared, so that others will have life? How could I share so much that there's some left over? So I don't measure it exactly. I'll give you this much, but I don't want to give you too much. <laughs> Cardinal Manning used to say, he thinks that 
one of the symbols of the baskets left over was more people should have been there maybe but how do we get more people there we become Eucharist how does this church come alive how do we come alive come alive in your homes in your families in your relationships how do you take on the wounds of the other person how do you carry the pain of the other person how do you extend a forgiveness which is not merited how do you become living Eucharist that's what it means if we stop short of that Eucharist does not come alive for us and if Eucharist does not come alive for us we can walk away and you'll find this by the way you, you, whoever's listening to this you're going to look this up look up chapter 6 in John's gospel and you will find Jesus gives a homily the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have life forever and so forth and his disciples say this is too much for us this Eucharist it's too much and Jesus said do you also and some people walked away and he says to his disciples do you also want to walk away and Peter said Lord to whom shall we go you have the word of eternal life so become living Eucharist today